Hello everyone, my name is Rich Ottinger and I am the Marketing Programs Manager for Park Systems, coming to you from Albany, New York. Welcome to today's webinar, Park Smart Litho, creating nanometer sized structures with ease. Before we begin, let me give you a quick overview of today's session. The presentation will last approximately 30 minutes, after which we will have time for a short Q&A. Please enter your questions at any time into the questions module of GoToWebinar. If you prefer, at the end of the presentation, you may click the raise your hand button and I will unmute your line so you can ask your question. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Park Systems Technical Service Engineer, Armando Melgarejo. Please welcome Armando. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, thanks for being here once again. Uh, my name is Armando. Thanks for the introduction, Rich. And uh, well, as Rich mentioned, today we're gonna be talking about our new Smart Lito software. Uh, well, today's webinar press, it's titled Creating Nanometer Size Structures with Ease. Before starting, I'm gonna give you a brief intro of what Park System is. So, as you already know, Park System is a world leading manufacturer of atomic form microscopes. Uh, Park System has a bio diverse variety of tools, IFM tools, which has uh, diverse applications in materials and chemicals um, risk, uh, fields. They also have uh, microscopes for applications in biotechnology and pharmaceutical industry. And of course, we have our tools for analysis failure in electronics or semiconductors. Uh, Park Systems has a well a variety of tools going from the research area to the automate the, to the industry area. Our research tools are well from semi-automatic to fully automated um, version of it of them, and our industrial tools tools are fully automate automotive automated. Um, systems which also allow us to use a uh, higher bigger bigger size uh, samples instead of using just five micron samples we can go up to 300 and well uh, park systems as very as different characteristics uh, among other distributors but what actually the enhance spark systems is basically our decouple x y and c scanners which will allow us to get uh, higher quality images uh, with a higher precision. We also have a well, what we call true non-contact mode, which is our scan, scan mode in non-contact mode, which will allow us to preserve the lifetime of our scan deliveries and to retain the quality and this and the, and the form of the can deliver for a longer time. And well, finally, as you may already know, we have our Parks Smart Scan software, which has a very friendly interface for those uh, novice users who have never been using IFM before, but it also allows uh, more expert ones to do any kind of measures they want. Uh, today's presentations will be divided in mainly uh, three, uh, three sections. The first one, I'm gonna talk to you a, a little bit about what nanolithography is, uh, the second one, I'm going to present to you our Smart Lito software. And finally, I'm going to show you some examples of analytic oxidation experiments of nanolithography. So to begin, as you all know, uh, IFM can modify surfaces sorry, uh, by applying force or an electric field. This is basically two modes that nanolithography can be uh, done. And well, we can also, besides nanolithography, we can also do nanomanipulation, which consists of modifying the surface by at the nanometer scale by using these two uh, methods, applying force or electric fields. We can move the particles around. And well, if we do this, it is always useful to have a non-destructive imaging option as we do in smart, in smart, scan, in smart Lito software which is helpful after you've been modifying an image, you don't want to modify it again using your contact mode imaging. So that's why we have the, non, the true non-contact imaging. And well, Park System software supports three different options, which is the C-scanner movement, uh, the set point option, and the bias mode. I will be talking about these three options later in the presentation. So, sorry. So first we have, uh, as I told you, we have two main, uh, classifications based on the operation mode. The first one is a force assisted method, which uh, consists of applying a certain amount of force to the sample to create defined uh, groups, uh, like we can see here in the image, typically on sub image, uh, sub samples like polymers. And then we have the second option, which is the bias assisted mode, 
which as the name says, consists of applying a certain amount of voltage to create oxide patterns on the surface of any sample. Well, it has to be able to generate oxide, right? Like metallic or semiconductor substrates. So right now I'm gonna show you a small video of how does this work. I already explained you that, but uh, the force assisted method, you apply a certain amount of force and depending on the amount of force, you will be able to create the, well, you will give the desired shape to the feature in here or you can apply a amount, certain amount of voltage and you will create the oxide patterns over the surface of our sample. The amount of voltage you apply will also affect directly the, the amount of oxide you will be forming in the surface, as also the humidity and the speed. So, so we already classified the, the modes based on the operation mode, but then after this operation mode, we can subdivide them in three more. The first one is called the C scanner mode, which what we mainly do is um, maintain the C position, the C servo um, in a constant uh, height. So we can move around our surface. We normally use this mode when we know really well our surface, it's an homogeneous uh, sample. So we don't have many variations on it and we don't damage our tool. And then if we don't uh, actually know our sample, it's a very uh, heterogeneous sample. We can always use the set point, which consists of applying a certain amount of force, which will always, which, which always be constant, but the C servo feedback will be enabled. So it will move around depending on the height of the sample. And we finally have the bias mode that it, well, it comes from the bias uh, assisted method. That you, well, as I already said, you have to apply a certain amount of voltage between the tip and the sample to create our, well, our local analytic oxidation. Uh, in this option, we also have we have the option to regulate the C servo feedback, or we we can turn it off. So it's basically one of these two, but applying voltage to create uh, oxide patterns. Uh, well, for the purpose of this uh, presentation, this webinar, I will be focusing we will be focusing on anodic oxidation. So, well, as we already know, this is used to generate oxide patterns on silicon substrate. In this example, of course, we can also use different kind of samples. And well, it consists in applying an electric field between the tip and the sample. You can hear in here. Uh, through the voltage that is being applied to the tip in this case, we, cr we create a flow of, flow of electrons. We'll dissociate, uh, these electrons will dissociate the water molecules in here, and the water molecules will be dividing into hydroxyl and oxide radicals, and these radicals will then react with the silicon molecules, generating our silicon oxide. Uh, well, we know this field over here, this menisque, as we can see here, it's caused thanks to the natural humidity of all objects. Uh, all objects has a, a thin layer of water, so this thin layer of water between the tip and the substrate will be used as an electrolyte that will enhance the chemical reaction between the silicon and the, well, the electrons in this case. Therefore, if we have um, more humidity or we apply more voltage, we're gonna alter the amount of oxide we're gonna be forming on the surface. Also, Quark Systems uses a closed loop uh, scan system. What do I mean with this? Well, uh, Park System uses the photo, the PSPD, the photo detector, in the XY scanner as the closed loop sensor. Uh, these will allow us to to create uh, to move in a vector movement instead of a raster movement. Uh, normally, all IFM techniques uh, work in a raster scan, which means it has to scan from left to right all on my image or from down to top or the other way around, but it has to go through all the background and the desired feature. And they will, will, this will take longer. This is how the scan uh, process normally works. But when we are doing nanolithography process, if we use vector movement, our vector will just go to the desired features. We'll trace the circling here and then the line, sorry, and then the other circle and then also the other line. So this vector movement, it's able thanks uh, thanks to the photo detector that we use as a closed loop. And we, you can see, even though we're using the vector, the precision of the image is the same one as the design, we, the previous design. Uh, so even though I already mentioned you, we use vector mode for this smart Lita software, uh, we also include the raster mode, even though we don't need it. And this, this raster mode is included in the, our bitmap option, 
will, that will allow you to insert any image or any feature you want. Like here you can see there was a photo included in here and this photo was done in raster mode. You can see even though it's done in raster mode, it actually uh, distinguishes between the properties of the background, uh, and, well, the desired object. In this case, it was the photo. And well, as previously mentioned, a smart Lito supports a different kind of uh, lithography modes. And well, here's another example. This is just a random scratch that was done in the surface of a sample uh, to show you that we can also do the other modes, not, not just anodic oxidation. So, so far, this is our intro of how does uh, nanolithography works. So now it's time for me to present you our smart Lito software. Uh, for for those of you have, who have already been using our smart scan, you can see that the interface in here it's pretty familiar. It actually uses our smart scan interface. So you can see here in the panel A, um, it's the one we know for the laser alignment and the PSPD alignment. But then we have the B panel, which is uh, we're going we're going to select the control mode we're going to be using. Uh, what I mean is if we're going to be using force assisted method or bias assisted method. And then we have the C panel, which is the drawing panel or the scan panel. And here you can see there was a pre-scan image taken before, and then a line where we're going to insert the new oxide, well, the oxide line we're going to be forming here. So you can see we can insert uh, any desired figure like dots, lines, multi-lines, rectangles, circles. Or if you are not happy with this option, you can always import the bitmap option in here. And we also have the object uh, object list here. It will show you all the all the objects we are we have already applied to our surface in here. And finally, we have the E panel. This is one of the most important ones, which which will, which will give us all the details of the figures that we are inserting in here, like the bias or the amount of force that we are going to be applying to our objects. So. Here I'm going to explain you a little bit more about these two panels, the B and E, which are the ones that are actually um, characterized with the lithography uh, mode. As you can see here, normally in smart scan, we come with just scan mode and spectroscopy mode. With the, but with the smart litho software, we can also use the lithography mode, which first will ask us which control mode we want to we wanna be using, if the C scanner or the set point, as we explained before. In this case, the set point was selected. And then if you want to do anodic oxidation, you got to select the bias mode to be able to apply a certain amount of bias. And then we have uh, the channel through which we're going to be applying the voltage. Uh, we normally apply the voltage to, to the tip as we are doing in this example. But as I mentioned in the definition of anodic oxidation, it doesn't really matter where the voltage comes from, from the tip of the sample. It just has to be an electric field between the tip and sample. So we can also apply it through the sample or if you're not happy with the amount of voltage you're applying, you can always use auxiliary channel two. Our software uh, will just allow us to apply from minus 10 to 10 volts. But if you use auxiliary channel two, you can connect external hardware for our high voltage kit. And then you can increase the voltage up to 200 volts or minus 200 volts. And then, well, inter object is in case you wanna track the movement of the, of the cantilever, to see how the actual the vector movement goes, you can apply uh, intervoltage between the, and in this case, it just knows you're not gonna, gonna be applying voltage when whenever you are drawing. You are also gonna be applying voltage whenever you are moving around the sample. And also we have the CC, uh, the C reference here. This is whenever you don't enable the C servo option, you gotta tell the software uh, at which height the C is, well, the C position is gonna be. But in this case, C servo is gonna be always on. And then the set point, the amount of force you're gonna be using, uh, you can import this set point from the scan option, which is what we're doing here in auto mode. But if you don't want to use the same set point you were using the scan, you can also select manual and you can do it yourself. And then the object edit panel or the E panel, we have here a couple of options. First of all, the bias, as you can see, we have start bias and end bias. Uh, this means we can apply a rampage voltage if we want, or we can just apply the same bias constantly during our uh, measurements. Then we have the same principle for the set point. We can control the amount of force uh, from the beginning to the end, or we can just apply a constant force through all the process. Then we have the XY speed. 
uh, lifted and extended. Lifted, this refers to the speed at which it's going to move whenever it's not doing the oxidation process, whenever it's not riding. And then we have the XY uh, speed extended. This is the speed at which it's going to be riding our, well, our features, or the speed at which it's going to be generating the oxide. This is why here it was selected a little bit slower. You have to make sure the, ox the oxide was formed. Then we have the sea load. This is also a reference of the height at which it's going to uh, lift or approach whenever the sea servo moves. And then we have these four options over here, the sea extended height, the sea extended speed, the lift height, and the lift speed. Uh, the extend height is the height at which it's going to stop whenever it's approaching to our sample. And the lift height is the, well, the height at which it's going to stop when it lifts from the sample. And the C extend speed is the, the speed at which it's going to approach the sample. And the lift speed is the speed at which it's going to lift from the sample. So this is basically just the same ones just for approaching and from lifting from the sample. And then we have the position of our lens. In this case, uh, as you saw in the previous slide, we are just drawing one, um, one line. And we can see the position when, it, when it's going to start in the X axis and the Y axis. And from this, we can do a quick math, and you can see that our line is going to be around 1.8 microns in long. And, well, you can always change the name of your object in here, but this automatically, the software gives a object to your name. Uh, one special feature here of our Smart Lita software, it comes with a Smart Lita designer. Uh, this one is also used as a Smart Scan interface, but this one is doesn't have to be related with our smart scan software. What I mean is you don't have to be sitting in front of your IFM to use this one. Uh, this designer can be installed in your personal computer or your laptop, and you can work from it from your office or your home. So you can design or all the oxide, oxide system you're going to be drawing or well, generating the oxide patterns or the scratch patterns. And once you're ready, you can even mo modify the bias set point once we're ready, you just have to export this to SmartScan, and we just click Start, and it will save you some time being in front of the IFM. So just as a quick uh, explanation, we are we did a quick experiment here using the Park and Extend. It was done with the SmartLita software, which I was using a multi 75G cantilever, which is a platinum coated one. And the sample that I was that it was used it's a silicon chip covered with some nanoparticles. Uh, the bias applied was minus five volts, and the set point was of 200 nanonewtons. So after this, I'm going to show you a quick video. So you can see here this is the pre-scan image with a line for comparison. Then the lithography process, we just select the line here. We are approaching, and once the parameters are ready, we just click start. And after a couple of seconds, it will be done. And then we go back to scan mode, and we can scan our image again. And you can see the precision of our closed loop system, that even though uh, it's just a vector movement, it retains the, the well, the same position that we told the software to, to be. Uh, we can see here, as you saw, in every literary process, there's always three, uh, three steps. It's a pre-scan which you first take uh, the image as a reference. In this case, we, we draw this line uh, to, for comparison. Then the second step is the actual lithography process, as we did before. Uh, well, the last step for this is the post-scan image. It's just to verify that our oxide patterns have been formed, as we see here. So after that, I'm going to show you the results of this brief experiment. So you can see that these two lines were drawn with the same cantilever and different amount of times. It's also important to mention that temperature and humidity were not controlled. But you can see here that the lung, well, both lungs are around 1.8 microns in lung. And the, at the height for both of them, it's roughly 1.4 nanometers. And the width is slightly different uh, from 35 nanometers from the first one to 47 from the second one. Uh, this could be explained uh, to the fact that this nanolithography process was done in contact mode and this contact mode, whenever you well, whenever you use contact mode, this, the tip is going to be uh, rough against the surface. Therefore, it's quite probably that the cantilever is going to be blunted. And every time you do, you do, you do contact mode, it's going to get it's going to get more blunted. So the radius of the cantilever is going to increase. 
therefore the width of our patterns is going to be higher, like in this case. Then some other examples of our nanolithography software will be this image over here. This was done using uh, the bitmap, so the raster mode. It was also done in the NX10. Uh, we were applying uh, minus 10 volts to the, to the black letters over here. And the background, well, we decided to not apply any amount of voltage. And the image is 10 by 10 microns. And there was also a, a platinum coated cantilever use, but with a, slow, uh, a smaller spring constant than the previous cantilever use. And you can see here, it clearly distinguished between the, the letters and the backgrounds. And you can see it's just like a raster mode takes longer than the vector mode in this example. Then we have uh, just another example of our nanoscale material pattern patterning. This is a, well, normally for nanolithography, one of the main problems is to actually keep uh, any of the desired features, any line, any arrays uh, parallel. Uh, well, but this can be, this is no problem with our smart little software. And this experiment, they were using a leveling method to do this, to con to actually have the areas parallel one to each other. And well, this leveling pl platform, it's a, uh, it, it gives more accuracy to the system and it's of easy of use. Uh, well, this is a promising technique for desktop nanofabrication. Whenever you see that you can actually trust the, the position you are telling the software to put the, the oxide patterns in here, like in this example. Then we have another example in here. We have the, well, this is a Christmas ornament we did. It's done in a, a 30 by 30 micron image. Uh, and what is interesting from here is the height of the, well, the small features in here, they have a, a, high, a height ranging from uh, 0.2 to 1.5 nanometers. This was also done in, this was, also, this was done in vector mode. And well, you can see here the 3D rendering that it actually follows the accuracy of the Christmas ornament. And so far, all the examples that I have shown you, uh, those examples were done, um, the lithography process was done in contact mode, but the post-scan image was taken in non-contact mode. Uh, but that's not strictly a rule. We can always use also contact mode for the post-scan image, as we see here. This is just an example of some concentric circles. Uh, they, were done, they were done in contact mode and um, post-scan in contact mode too. So we can see the topography image, the lateral force image. The lateral force image just gives us the information of the well, the lateral movement of my cantilever of the laser. So therefore, it also gives us the, inf the, the friction information of the sample with the cantilever. Uh, we can see here that the, well, the, the average height for the three circles is of 2.5 nanometers. You can see that here in the 3D render. Uh, well, the width of them, that what was changing from 150 to 200 nanometers, the voltage applied was always constant with minus 10 volts. But the writing speed was from 1.5 to 0.5 microns. So actually the width was related with the speed at which the circles were written. That's one of also one of the crucial factors whenever you're doing nanolithography, as you know, besides humidity, besides uh, voltage, also the writing speed is crucial for, to see how, uh, yeah, how thick or how, how tall is gonna be our oxide patterns forming the surface. And we also have our bias assisted, well, this is another example to show uh, the repl replicability of our software. Uh, we can see here that there were three lines written. Uh, this cantilever was not a platinum coated one. This was a gold coated one, the NSC14 cantilever. Uh, there was a constant voltage of minus 10 volts. And the three lines were done also in contact mode and the post scan image was, was also done in contact mode. And well, you can see here that the width of the three lines is basically the same. It's a 100 point, yeah, 123, 125 uh, nanometers width. And the height of the three of them, it's an average 1.4 nanometers for all of them. And well, that's an, just another example of how the software can actually replicate its results and follows the precisions thanks to the closed loops uh, scanning we use here. 
uh, this is the, the order we gave them, and you can see that they're completely straight without any kind of uh, deformation or angle in, the, in between them. So just some highlights from this uh, small presentation that I just gave you. So nanolithography mode allows to manipulate and create patterning on the sample surface to apply force uh, voltage, well, to apply force or voltage. And more importantly, uh, SmartLit software, as it uses the SmartScan interface, it has a very friendly interface that allows novice users to create nanoscale patterns easily. So that will be all for this presentation. I think it was even shorter than expected, but there's some questions I will be happy to answer them now. All right, thank you, Armando. We do have uh, one question in so far, and everyone else, if you have any questions, you can input them in the questions module or uh, use the raise your hand feature, and I will call on you shortly. The question we have is uh, from one of your examples, uh, what in this case is the role of the nanoparticles on the silicon surface, if any? Oh, there is no any role from them. It's just in that moment, I didn't have any cleaner source uh, sample. Mm -hmm. But it's important of that sample is just that it's a silicon sample that actually allows me to create a It might be a comparison between just the height of the lines and the height of the nanoparticles. And if you see them, like in this, in the 3D render that Rich is showing, you can see those nanoparticles are even taller than our well nano feature that we were creating. All right. If there are any other questions, I'll just give you guys a moment to see if you can get those in or get your hand raised. All right, I don't see anything. So thank you, Armando, and thank everyone for joining us this afternoon or, or morning, wherever you are. The next webinar in this series is scheduled for Wednesday, July 29th, uh, once again at noon Eastern time. On the topic of SICM and SECM imaging presented by Dr. Jiali Zhang, visit parksystems.com slash online nano academy to find info and register for all of our upcoming online offerings. We do have a hand raise now, so I will maybe go back and uh, see if we can get one more question snuck in here. Yep. Navroon, go ahead. Uh, so uh, what is the maximum sample size that can be done on by using a uh, smart lithography mode? The sample size, you mean the, the maximum sample size you can scan? It depends on the... A scanner your system has, but uh, the one that I mean, was using, I was using a 50 micron scanner, but for the N extent, you can actually uh, increase this to 100 micron. But okay, if you're uh, talking about... Uh, what about for our NX20? So okay. if you're using NX20, probably you have a uh, 100 uh, micron scan, but you have to check that because NX20 can also be sold with a 50 micron scanner. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, thanks for that question. I will now uh, just continue where I was, I guess. Thank you all for joining us. You can find more information about Park Systems AFM at parksystems.com, and please direct any AFM questions you have to inquiry at parksystems.com. If you have any questions specific to this webinar series, feel free to reach out to me directly at richard at parksystems.com. Thanks again for joining, and take care, everyone.